Uh, I will be introducing our speaker next. My name is Kerry Rivard. If you didn't get a chance to come out to the farm last night, um, I'm one of the faculty on the organizing committee here and also the director of the Horticulture Center where we had the social last night. Quickly, I'd like to remind everybody, please silence their phones. That's always the most important part of a, introducing a speaker. So uh, about, well, actually, I'm not exactly sure how long ago, but a long time ago, I was driving out to North Carolina to start graduate school out there. Uh, and uh, I stopped at a family friend's house who was also a professor at University of Tennessee. And I said, oh, I'm really excited to start school at NC State, da 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 da, da. And I said, it's a really great school. And, and this guy said, no, Kerry, it's not a great school. They have a, really, a lot of really great people there. Uh, so it's, it's my privilege to introduce you to one of the great people from NC State University. And that is Dr. Nancy Creamer. Uh, and I met Nancy back in 2002 when I was working out at CEFS as an intern and then returned there later to do graduate studies and worked with her a fair amount and definitely at CEFS quite a bit after that. Uh, Nancy got her, <coughs> was a born and raised in California, uh, got her PhD at Ohio State University and is now a distinguished professor of horticulture and also the director for the Center for Environmental Farming Systems uh, in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, and I'm sure she's probably gonna tell us more about CEFS during her talk today. So I'll just go ahead and stop it there and say, welcome Nancy. Good morning, everybody. Carrie was saying, don't you have some kind of title like distinguished or something? And I said, yeah. And I said, but I'm not very distinguished. <laughs> so I'll have to tell you the story. The day they put out the press release that I was named a distinguished professor, that morning I had carried my stuff out to my car and I forgot something. So I put it actually behind my car, which was really stupid. And then, by the t and then I got distracted inside. And by the time I came out, I forgot that it was there. So I backed up over my backpack and my laptop. And so then I picked it up and I was so upset and I carried it to my car and I got to work and realized my bright yellow shirt was covered in road dirt <laughs> from my car. <laughs> So I just totally didn't feel very distinguished. And I started getting all these congratulatory emails about being a distinguished professor. So it kept me very humble from the very beginning. <laughs> um, anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, Kerry, uh, thank you for inviting me to come. And he was really a superstar. You guys are lucky to have him. And I think it really showed last night at the farm how wonderful that place looked and and this symposium which has been fabulous uh, you know he was an intern at SAFS and I'll tell you a little bit about our internship program and then came back as a grad student as you said and we had our 20-year anniversary I guess three years ago or two years ago and I don't think he knows this but we actually had a competition for what students and past interns to bring back to kind of feature on our program and so he was voted as uh, to bring back and got to tell a little bit about his story there so he was a superstar there too um so i'm going to talk uh, carrie asked me to talk about uh our development of a statewide action plan that we did in north carolina a number of years ago so i really had to dredge my brain to remember all the process stuff but the action plan really it's still very relevant to us we it still guides a lot of our work and it has guided guided the future work in north carolina in a, in a major way so i think it's uh it's nice for me to be able to tell that story it's not uh completely directly urban agriculture focused but it's more about planning and process and developing new partnerships and bringing people to the table and engagement, which I think is really also very important when it comes to urban agriculture as much. It's those soft skills that, uh, you know, it's interesting you're doing a poll about those because I could tell you about a lot of them that are very important that you never learn in graduate school, <laughs> not any of them, at least maybe, at least when I went to graduate school. Um, Page down does not work. That did not work. Okay. 
that worked. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, I am going to tell you a little bit about our center and sort of how we evolved over the years to from working on just production systems to food systems and why why we did that and why it's important, I think, in all of this work going forward because it really is a revolution, right? Um, it's really exciting to see what's happening across the country now. How we developed the statewide action plan and if I get have time, I'll talk about what other states can do uh, to foster the development of a thriving local food economy. Um, but I would like to make this interactive. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand and ask them and I'm happy to do that. So, uh, as I said, we began 22 years ago, which was before local food systems was cool. So it's really nice for me to be a cool kid now. Um, <clears throat> and really, we we were focused on sustainable agriculture, um, which at that time was still really pretty controversial. In fact, our name, Center for Environmental Farming Systems, was because the word sustainable was too hard too uncomfortable for people to say. And so uh, this was our mission statement at the time, and you can see it's focused on the three tenets of sustainable agriculture. We're a partnership of NC State University, NC a and State University, and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, and have been from the beginning, and that partnership is very important to the work that we do. Our mission has expanded over the years. This is our current mission statement, and you can see that it includes words like just and equitable, health, community. Uh, so we've really gone from working on sustainable production systems to food systems in a number of ways. Uh, our three focus areas, when we started, what we were was a research farm, kind of like we were at yesterday. We have a 2,000 acre facility in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where we, that was, CEFS was a place. Well, now it's kind of a program, but then it was a place and we still say, I'm going to CEFS today, even though it doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the early components were the research and the extension and outreach, and we added the food systems later. So our research farm, again, it's 2,000 acres. We have a very large comparative research trial that's 200 acres. <clears throat> we have 100 certified acres organic research facility. We have a pasture dairy, a pasture beef operation, a sustainable swine production unit, and a small farm unit. So that's still going on and still uh, a major part of the work that we do. And it gives us the opportunity to address some very complex and interdisciplinary problems. We've been interdisciplinary from the very beginning. That's one of the values that we always have had. <clears throat> Uh, extension, education, and outreach have also been important from the very beginning. Uh, and we integrate as much as we can all those three components, the mission of the land-grant university and all the work we do. So at the center, uh, the, the field site, we have a eight-month apprentice program, and the apprentices are working in all those different components. We have the two-month uh, two intensive summer internship program. That's the program Carrie um, participated in. We do lots of workshops. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of extension and outreach. And our extension and outreach has really broadened, too, to, to do a lot of community outreach and general public outreach in addition to just the agriculture community. So what took us from production systems to food systems, and it kind of mirrors, I think, I think our transition kind of mirrors the transition in this movement over the last, a long time. <laughs> so I've been working in sustainable agriculture for more than 30 years, so um, it's been a long time. So. You know, North Carolina back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of uh, news stories about the hog industry there. And we had the second highest large numbers of hogs after Iowa. Um, and, and they're raised really in a pretty environmentally sensitive area. So there was a lot of uh, overflowing of hog lagoons. We had hurricanes that just sent lots of effluent down some pretty sensitive rivers 
very sandy soils, lots of fish kills. It was in the news almost every day. There was a major lawsuit in the state. Smithfield Foods had to agree to kind of redo their waste management. All the environmental groups, all the sustainable ag groups were pushing very hard to tear down that system. So we decided that we would uh, try to work with those organizations on a more of a demand poll kind of, okay, if you don't like how it's done, why don't, if you will agree to buy product from farmers who are doing it in a way that meets your environmental or social ethic, will you commit to that? And we'll work with, there's lots of farmers who'd be willing to raise their animals outdoors. And so they agreed and we responded to a Kellogg Foundation RFP on university community partnerships. As a good horticulturalist, uh, my department heads were a little concerned that I was writing a big pig grant, but <laughs> I was, there's the interdisciplinary nature of <laughs> our work. Um, and there, so there was this huge market demand to Sierra Club, at, and at the time in the state had 17,000 members that they could reach with a keystroke. And so we had huge market potential. And they told me, they said, you know, a lot of the vegetarians really love bacon, so if they could find animals that were raised in a way that they could support, you know, that would be a pretty big market. And they said that, I didn't say that. <laughs> and we also had uh, plenty of producers really who were willing kind of to take this on. And so we partnered with all of the big environmental groups, sustainable ag groups, the ones that were involved very significantly in the lawsuits. They hated the university at the time. I mean, they couldn't believe that some, anyone was at the university who were, was thinking about any kind of alternatives. Um, and so this is what we learned really quickly in the whole process was that, you know, we over, uh, as the industrialized agriculture has taken hold, we have really lost the capacity. We didn't have the capacity to get those animals to market in North Carolina. It didn't exist. We had, even though we had, I think the largest processor of pigs in the world, maybe at Smithfield Foods, right down the road, they couldn't take animals from smaller farmers to process. We had hardly any processing centers that could, you know, we had processors who were used to, maybe someone would bring in their cow and, and take it home to their freezer. But as far as professionalizing packaging and all of that stuff. We didn't have any place that a small farmer could take their animal to get value-added bacon, you know, bacon or any value-added product. It was just not there. And so we just kind of realized that, you know, this whole, there's this, all this energy around people wanting local food systems. And unless we worked on that and tried to solve those problems, it didn't matter. We were really pretty pleased with some of the production system stuff we were coming up with at SEFs. We felt good about the systems. They could be economically viable, environmental, and all that stuff. But, you know, if you can't help your producers get it to market, then it's not really worth it. So that's kind of what got us into working more across the whole food system and not just production systems. And we started a project out of that called NC Choices, which was named that way because we wanted consumers to have choice. We wanted farmers to have choice. Uh, in retrospect, it's a stupid name for a pig marketing project. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, so just a little tiny summary of where that led to. Um, so now that project has really grown quite large. We put on a huge Carolina meat conference every other year that sells out at 400. We have restaurateurs there, chefs there, we have processors there, we have uh, farmers there. It's just a really amazing across the supply chain uh, uh, project we also do on the off years, we do a big women working in the meat business and we bring women in from all over the country also in all the supply chain uh, areas. So it's just really grown. We had to spin off a business as part of this work. You know, there was no middle entity that could was buying from these small producers. You know, with the animals, it's a lot harder than vegetables because you have to find markets for all the parts. And so you might find someone who wants hamburger, but they don't want your fine steaks. And so the marketing of those animals without having some kind of 
aggregator in the middle who could take from a lot of different farmers uh, is difficult. And so uh, the director of our NC Choices said, this is not going to be fixed until this business exists. And so she worked with the business school at UNC and got a partner and they have launched this business now. It's multi-million dollar now. And it's they buy from about 40 producers and sell to 60 different entities in North Carolina. It's completely for profit now. So it doesn't have, we're not, it's not associated with us anymore. Uh, but just uh, kind of a little aside, it, you can see on the truck there that uh, it used to be called Farmhand Foods when it started. And Smithfield Foods uh, put out a cease and desist order on them because they said the name was too close to one of their subsidiaries <laughs> and it would have cost them so much money to fight that. So the big guy got really upset with the little, it's kind of humorous in a way. <clears throat> So this is what's happened to the industry over the last, uh, these, the, when, you, when you're a farmer and you handle meat, so if you take your animal to the market and then pick it up package and go to a farmer's market to sell it or whatever, you have to be registered. So when we started this, there was one registered farmer meat handler in the state and now there's more than a thousand. So we feel really you know, proud of sort of <laughs> spurring on that industry. And I guess kind of diving into the into that kind of work prepared us for helping us as a state um, develop an action plan. And so by 2008, um, you know, this movement has just exploded and we had a lot of very strong organizations in the state who are around for a very long time working on these issues. Um, Agencies were getting involved, funders were getting involved, lots of new little businesses popping up, but we were not coordinated or organized. Um, so there might be, you know, a funder might fund an incubator farm in one part of the state or a community kitchen in another part of the state or, you know, some other program. And so they were, the funders really came to us and said, you know, we're not, we don't have any momentum. We're funding all this local food systems work. And as a state, we're not really getting anywhere. We don't know where we could strategically put our money to kind of help move it forward. And so they funded us, several different funders funded us to kind of bring people together in the state and develop this strategic action plan. And so the goal was to develop a statewide action plan for building the local food economy that would describe our current food system, highlight important successful models in the state, prioritize policies and programs, and build networks and coordinators. So that's the work I'm going to tell you about today and try to tell you. Is there any questions so far? No. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so... Uh, and I guess it's this work is something else we're really proud of because the things that came out of the action plan have mostly been completed now. So we're working on a round two, which I'll tell you about also. So the first thing we did was we uh, got some great facilitators. And I think this is one of those soft skills that we never really learn. And I think a lot of faculty or others try to kind of muddle through process things, not really knowing what we're doing. And I think the best thing that we did with this was we hired professionals who actually know how to do process. And it made a huge difference to us. So we had a really great sort of map of where we needed, wanted to be at the end of it and what all the steps would be going towards that. So this first step was to put together an advisory committee. Who has an advisory committee with that many people? I'm like, nobody. <laughs> but food systems are really complicated. And we knew it was going to be important. Like I said, there are lots of great things happening already. And we couldn't just as CEFs come out and say, we're going to develop an action plan by ourselves. It had to involve and engage all of these different organizations where all the momentum was. And so by the time you get one of everything, right, you're up to 70 people or 80 people. I think we might have had 80 people in this advisory committee. And we kind of were like, this is crazy. But we couldn't think of, well, who are you going to leave out then? You know, you can't pick who you're going to leave out. So we decided to go with it. And I think it was a really good 
in the end, a very good thing to do because we got people involved in the very beginning. They felt like developing this action plan, they were part of it. It was theirs. It wasn't just Seth's action plan. It was everybody who was in, not everybody, but a lot of people. So the second step was to uh, do some regional meetings across the state. We were going to do just three. And uh, I guess we were really amazed at how much interest there was, both in the urban settings and the rural settings. So we uh, ended up doing six of them across the state. And the idea of these was to gather ideas for action, to catalog what was happening then in their areas, where they felt the gaps were, where there was energy around making a difference, and to get people to know each other. This was a long time ago, so these groups hadn't come together very often. <clears throat> and um, so we gathered a lot of information at these. And um, I put this last bullet on here. How many of you have been in meetings where you've been completely derailed by trying to define sustainability or local foods? Come on, I know you do. <laughs> you have. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, that tension is always there. And our facilitating team had just a wonderful way of dealing with that. Because especially, you know, 30 years ago when we were trying to any meeting we had was completely derailed by people wanting to fight about what the word sustainable agriculture meant. So I did not want to go there. But our facilitating team just had a great way to handle it in the very beginning. They just put up a big white sheet of paper and they asked the question, what does local foods mean to you? And people would raise their hands and say it out loud and they would write it down and they wrote down what everybody said so people felt really acknowledged and that they got it out there and then they did the same with sustainable agriculture and then we moved on and everybody was fine <laughs> i was just amazed at how well that worked you know i think no we didn't nobody felt like we had to agree i mean the definitions were quite different you know from being 100 miles to across the state local foods nobody felt like we had to agree it just really put it to rest and that's where this kind of process stuff i think can be really important <clears throat> our third step was developing a working issue team so we took all of the information it was tons of information that came out of all the regional meetings and we put together some really focused, small groups of experts or people who were either impacted by or uh, knew a lot about or were really focused on that area to work on those. And I can't tell you how many jokes we had about being at your wits end and how the nitwits involved in the... <laughs> uh, we, we made quite use of the wits term. Uh, but these small groups uh, were ta tasked with, in a very short order, coming up with what we called game changer ideas. What was the next big thing in that particular area that would move the state forward in that arena? And that was another, I think, brilliant idea of our facilitators because so many of these state action plans come out with like this huge laundry list of things that are all wonderful things, but there's not a lot of energy around getting them done because there's so many of them. You don't kind of know where to start. So we kind of made people figure out where they were going to start. Um, and so the the ones that came out, I'll just tell you what they were. One, The first one was uh, what we called formalizing the initiative. This was like, how are we going to keep this work going after the grant funding and after the state action plan? And we we did have hopes and kind of steered it in a direction of getting a, you know, a legislated sustainable local foods policy council. The rest of them we didn't direct quite as much. <laughs> but far, these were the 11 things that came out of all the discussion across the state that were important to people. Farm to school, uh, institutional retail markets, public health and food access disparities, direct markets, new and transitioning farmer support, community gardens, land use and local government, youth and social networking, consumer outreach and marketing, and processing and other physical infrastructure. So those, we had working issue teams about each one of those. And I guess one other kind of lesson learned, you know, you can slice and dice this way in a gazillion different ways because it's a system and it's complicated and everything interacts. And so you can't, 
we got bogged down for a while. Like, how are we going to categorize things? And I think you just can't. You just have to realize this is a system. Um, and so then our final step was hosting a statewide summit that brought all those people together again and new people um, to raise broad public awareness about the issue. Our governor came and she pounded on the podium and told everybody they were red hot, you know. <laughs> it was great. Um, wasn't our current governor. <laughs> Um, <laughs> when they're too busy, like, restricting bathroom use for people now. Um, <sighs> sorry. So we presented the Game Changer ideas to people, but we didn't try to get everybody to agree on them. The Game Changer ideas were things that were going to happen, like, on a statewide level. What we did with all that energy in the room was kind of break people up into their regions and got them thinking about a lot of ideas had come out where there was energy for action in the different regions and get people together. Uh, our, our state summit was planned for March 15th or so and it doesn't ever snow in North Carolina in March and um, we ended up with a major snowstorm that day and had to, we had this, you can see this huge room that was all ready with things on the wall and we had tens of thousands of dollars worth of local food purchased and we had to make the call to cancel the summit. <laughs> And, you know, that was all our grant money that, like, out, you know, you've already spent everything. <laughs> and so we were just, we were just like, what are we going to do as we sent the email out? And we were flooded with, you have to have the summit. And we had people stepping up with funding for us to reschedule that summit, which we did. So we had it like two months later. And it was, it was just amazing to us how much the engagement of people across the state had gotten people very vested in what came out in the end. <clears throat> So this probably doesn't seem very novel anymore, but back in 2008, you know, when we had broadened our partnerships from sustainable ag to environmentalists, these were all new partners to us and a lot of new partners to all of the sustainable food systems people. And, you know, I think getting real creative on who should be at the table is really important important, another lesson learned. We worked very hard to keep all of agriculture at the table from sustainable ag to conventional ag, and I think we were successful in doing that because you can see some of the uh, conventional ag organizations helped to support it and uh, promote it as well. So I'm going to go into what some of the outcomes were. Is there any questions on the process? No. Okay. One. Well, I'm interested, but you might get there. How you were able to, um, with the conventional ag groups at the table, how you were able to, if they deterred you from going in certain directions. Yeah, not really. I think we. Um, in CEFs generally from the beginning, I mean, we've been around from for a very long time in a very controversial way. You know. And I think from the beginning have always chosen not to go about our work by saying this is what's wrong with agriculture. We just talk about these are the opportunities. And so I think the summit had that tone. So it was, I'm sure there was some grumbling, but it was not, it wasn't really directly threatening to them. And we put some of those folks on our, the working issue team around foundations and baselines that where we wanted out of that uh, legislated, we put Farm Bureau, the Department of Agriculture, and the sustainable ag groups on that too. The people who could either make it happen or stop it from happening were put on that very strategically. Um, so our, we, we, our action plan, I think, is one of, was a great thing that came out of it. It took quite a while to put together after all of that stuff. It's on our website. You can download it for free. It's about 150 pages. So we have the game changers in there, but of, of course we have, we have the whole rest of it too. And we talk about, uh, you know, 
what's happening in North Carolina and the opportunity and all that. So feel free to look at it. Um, another outcome of it was, you know, and another lesson learned is to have funders at the table from the very beginning. So we had the Golden Leaf Foundation, which was tobacco settlement money at the table. <clears throat> And they, right after the summit, they put a two and a half million dollars out in a in a competitive RFP for any group to apply to do some of those game changer ideas. And they funded several of them, including the 10% campaign that CEFs ran, but they also did some infrastructure market development and they also funded the local food policy council. And they were on that working issue team. <laughs> Blue Cross and Blue Shield and North Carolina Foundation, they've been a major funder of ours. Of course, they're very interested in healthy outcomes and lowering their insurance outlays because of all these health-related diseases. So um, they also did an RFP to fund things around uh, access, things that could help health indicators. They also bought five tractor trailers for the Farm to School program shortly after that and also helped to support one of the game changers, which, which was to get a community garden in every county in the state and get them networked together. <clears throat> um, so we did, uh, it was quite difficult, but we did get uh, legislation through to, and I love this purpose statement. You can take a minute to read it. It was a wonderful uh, piece of legislation and there were definitely controversies along the way, but we, because we had those people at the table, they were kind of fighting for it instead of trying to stop us um, from doing it. Um, and so it had 27 members on it, uh, Commissioner of Ag, Secretary of Commerce, State Health Director, uh, SEFs, Extension, food banks, lots of the organizations that were involved and mostly had three, you can tell I'm talking about in the, fa the past tense. Um, <laughs> and so we, we addressed uh, lots of different kinds of things. I think uh, generally it was very successful in getting some important, important things done, uh, both through policy, but also I not so much in policy, just getting those people at the same table. One major thing that came out of it was the Department of Ag had been interpreting the, the rules around how many poultry you could process on the farm as being a thousand. I think it was a thousand, Joanna, is that right? And uh, just, and there was a lot of angst in the community that was trying to process more poultry. It was just not an economically viable number for them to do that. And so getting everybody to the table and getting them to do a deep dive in what the policy actually said, they upped that to 20,000, which then brings it to an economically viable number. So there were some big wins along the way that didn't necessarily have to do with policy change. This is the first emoticon I've ever used in a slide presentation. <laughs> But in, uh, you know, I don't know if you follow North Carolina politics, but, you know, we had a very stable legislature for many hundred years. It was uh, stable in the Democratic Party. And then we had a switch and lots of things went by the wayside. And this was one of them. Um, and it was interesting because the reason this got unlegislated we fought pretty hard to have the word sustainable in the in the legislation. So it was the Sustainable Local Food Policy Council. And conventional ag was okay with that. And we used the definition that was in the farm bill so many years ago. And it was unlegislated, not because of sustainable agriculture, but because the folks who came in were really worried about Agenda 21, the UN sustainability. <laughs> they thought this was somehow associated with that, even though the definition we used was 20 years before that. And so they unlegislated us, but we, the group is still meeting. We're still a sustain, we, we're the local food council of North Carolina. We just don't have a legislature. And we debated a lot about, we decided not to go with the governor's executive order because we thought it would be a lot more stable to be legislated, but that's not necessarily true if you're trying to decide. Um, we also uh, 
uh, one of the game changers was this community garden in every county and networked and we uh, the community garden partners now are now a 501c3 and have really moved that game changer forward <clears throat> the North Carolina 10% campaign came out of the communications working issue team the idea was to do kind of a fun campaign that would raise awareness and uh, get people to start buying local food. So 10% isn't very much if you're already committed, right? But if you're a big institution and you want to dip your toe in, 10% is a pretty reasonable, there's a lot of barriers to doing it. So 10%, so that was the idea that there were, people felt there was this kind of almost oppressive like the 100 mile diet and you have to have buy every if you're going to buy local you have to buy everything local and so to try to bring new people in that's why it was the 10 percent campaign and so uh, it's been a great campaign uh, we've tracked this is a this website in real time when you sign up for the campaign uh, you get an automated email that asks you, you know, what your size of your family, how much do you spend on food, and then every week you get an email that says, how much did you spend on local food this week, and it feeds into this website. So we're at about $69 million now, but it's more to raise awareness. We have a thousand uh, business partners that range from our first business partner before launch was Compass Group, which is the largest food service company in the world. They own Chartwells and other food service. So they put all of their universities, school systems, hospitals that they have in North Carolina into the campaign for fruits and vegetables. So we had some really significant buy-in to the campaign. And one thing that uh, was a great outcome of this is we asked Cooperative Extension, you know, if we get the funding for the campaign, will you designate a local food coordinator in every county in the state, one of your existing agents to help with the campaign. And so they agreed to do that. And so those folks do events in their counties. They can respond if they get an automated email. If a business signs up in their county, they can help with that connection. Um, and so a lot of those people were the folks really excited about local food. Some of them weren't weren't so excited in our more rural counties. So, but I think generally it's worked really well. And extension has uh, has really transformed into being such a support for local food. So they have uh, now those folks are pretty much institutionalized. They came out and and called Local Foods their new flagship program a couple of years ago. They've hired Joanna Lalikas, who's here somewhere in the back, as the flagship coordinator. Those local food agents now are helping with a range of types of projects around local food, farm to school, all kinds of stuff. So that's another lesson learned is we have really big institutions between our universities, extension, departments of ag, public health, people who are in every county and to leverage the institutional change for our issues, I think, is very, very important because we'll never have enough grant money to <laughs> hire people in every county. But if you can get the people who are in the counties already helping facilitate this, it's a really great. One of the game changers uh, was to have a statewide team network, kind of a council for teens. And so that's a very active and vibrant part of our programming now. And they do, they're just wonderful group of youth across the state. Uh, on farm to school, the game changer was to develop a model farm to school pre-service training. So to get to the teachers before their teachers during their training and teach them about farm to school and ASAP got a grant and has, has uh, done that game changer. And also as, as wasn't one of the game changers, but uh, because of the people who came together in the process, we were able to compete and were one of the first inaugural states for the Food Corps program, which is also focused on farm to school. Our institutional market game changer was um, to do a model big institutional program with Fort Bragg, our military base. And so we got a 3.9 million AFRI grant to scale up local food supply into military and also a big grocery chain in the state. So that was that game changer. 
Um, our county government and municipality support, the game changer was to get a state procurement goal established. We were not able to do that, but we found a lot of different ways to help local governments do, you know, a lot of them have joined the 10% campaign. People have resolutions. They've done incubator farms. We have a local gov government toolkit. So just trying to support on a local level them stepping into this. So most of these lessons I've already talked about, um, pay attention to process, have good facilitators. Don't shy away from being inclusive, even if it means you have advisory committees of 80 people. Don't underestimate the interest both in rural and urban areas. Uh, diffuse tension early in the process. Engage people along the way. I think that's been really important for us getting all the game, not all, but a lot of the game changers done because people wanted to see them happen. Um, don't get too bogged down in how to categorize things. I think I've said all these things. Having funders at the table from the beginning, I think, is an important thing. So where are we now? And I'll just do for like another couple minutes. I think I have till 10. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield, you know, as we kind of got a lot of those big ideas done, uh, they were interested in doing another round of action planning. What are the next set of game changers? And so they funded us to do that. And we're taking a very different approach after lots of different conversations. And that is to support and develop local and regional food policy councils across the state and to network them together and to network them to the state council as well as a way to generate ideas, get action done, and also to share measurement and data collection so that we can actually track progress over time to the things people are interested in. So community food strategies uh, is the project of CEFs, and we have other partners involved in that project that is leading that work. Oh dear, this comes out like I borrowed this slide. Um, so there's almost, there's between 35 and 40 food policy councils now that are in some stage of development across the state. And the community uh, food strategies is working for, to provide technical assistance, training for them, support facilitation services, and also working with the state council uh, so that we can support uh, the council so that there's policy ideas flowing back and forth. So some policies can happen at the local level, some need to be at the state level, and so to have a communication way to, to deal with that. So they've developed a lot of different toolkits to help the support of local food call policy councils. I think I'm going to stop there and just answer questions. <laughs> I just wondered if you could comment on like the regulations for the meat processing. It seems like from what I've read, there's a one size fits all for the very massive operations. And then when you have these smaller operations, they have difficulty, you know, having the volume to, to meet um, the regulations. Yeah, that's true. Now in North Carolina, we have two inspection processes. So there's the federal inspe inspection and regulation process if you're going to ship out of state, but our Department of Ag also does a state regulation. So in some ways, probably some of the difference is taken care of there, but it's really difficult and it's not just meat. I mean, it happens in a lot of the different industries that there's this one size fits all that regulations that make no sense whatsoever on the scale we're talking about. So addressing some of those things can be changed at a local level versus a federal level and figuring out what those are and working on them I think is an important action that can happen in the states. What were some of the outreach strategies that you used to engage a diverse audience in your network and all? I think just, uh, you know, we, 
We just started developing partnerships and networks through the advisory group, I guess. And, you know, it's just kind of escalates. People know people, people know organizations and, uh, and then just outreach to them and trying to bring them in. I know with the, you know, community food strategies, a lot of the policy councils aren't very representative yet of the communities in which they serve. And so, you know, we're working on trying to alleviate that and make sure that it is representative. There's a trade-off, you know, in those local councils and different sort of thoughts about whether you want government at the table, you know, and whether that's a significant way to make change or the people people already in power, you know, versus people who are most affected by the system. And so I think getting a mix of those type of people is probably the best thing to do, but there's different sort of strategies and ways to think about it. You deal with your relationship with your state uh, agriculture consum consumer service. Well, they're a partner of ours, and they own the research facility where we are. They, the Department of Ag in North Carolina owns a lot of the research facilities. So they've been a partner from the beginning, but they're not, but when that partnership started, it was really about the research station. And so that part of it goes really smoothly. The part where now we're doing marketing and working a lot with farmers and institutional there's been tension, I have to admit, because I think there's a lot of areas where they feel like that's theirs, and they think about us at the university should be in a very traditional extension role and research role versus working on big local food systems projects. The marketing campaign, the 10% campaign, you know, they have a got to be in C program, which is there, you know, trying to, to get people to buy North Carolina projects. So they were very, uh, what's the word? <laughs> they weren't excited about our 10% campaign. And we kept saying to them, we're just an amount. When people engage, like our website says, okay, if you want 10% local, here's how to find it. Go look for Got to Be and See. We thought it made so much sense and that would really help them and we could market together, but they, they just were never really interested in that. They felt felt like it was competition. So I can't tell you. In some parts of our CEF's work, it works really well. In some parts, not so well. <laughs> Is anybody here from Department of Ag? No. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Um, I just have a question on how you um, make some some clarifications or how that works because I'm probably an unusual person in this room especially um, and I don't think that conventional ag and sustainable ag are opposites um, and so my question for the you is if there's a smaller producer who uses more conventional methods, like for example, um, they use GMOs, or for example, they use implants for cattle. Are they allowed to be part of your programs where you're doing some of that local food marketing, or how how do you work with the differences in between, you know, like fully organic and someone who is more interested in a local food right. movement? That's a good question, and I don't know if I have the best answer for it. Um, you know, with the 10% campaign, it's local. So we don't say you have to be sustainable or organic. Some of the biggest, uh, like Smithfield Foods in the state, they can't tell you that it's local, right? They're buying pigs from all over the place, even though we have lots of pigs there. So they can't, you can't use Smithfield food pork and the other large meat suppliers, you can't say, they can't be part of the 10% campaign. Like an institution can't say, that's how I meet my pledge um, because of that, because they can't. So 
to me, it's a uh, it's a process of learning and opportunity. So. My philosophy is that the more people know about agriculture and care about agriculture and want to know who their farmer is and all that stuff, because I've been, you know, I, my work at NC State before all of this, local, I was like the organic person. So I've been kind of slammed by some of the folks in the state who question, it's like, oh, now you're talking about organic. I mean, local, you've abandoned organic. And I'm, I'm very committed to sustainable production systems and organic agriculture. And the way I think about it is once people get in, once consumers become aware and start asking the right questions, they may end anywhere, but they generally migrate on that continuum towards more sustainable systems. And so I think that's a really good thing. So I don't have any conflict in kind of bringing people in in a wide tunnel. And I think for producers too, you know, a lot of them are interested in making changes if the market were there and that's how you get the market there. So I don't know if that's a good enough answer. <laughs> but we don't try to be the sustainable police or anything and say you're in and you're out. We don't do that. Well, I think that message of inclusion seems like a great place to stop and go have our break. <laughs> So let's uh, all thank Nancy for being here.